Welcome to the Crypto and Blockchain Talk. Hello. Hey. Hello. 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 Namaste. Hello. Salve. Ciao. Bonjour. Our podcast talks about the latest trends in the worlds of cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Crypto and Blockchain Talk. And with me this week, I have none other than the lovely Mr. Jonathan Dunsmore of Dunsmore Law. And we're going to need him today because we're going to be talking about a lot of aspects of law that are going to be coming in and perhaps in some way, shape or form, they will affect you, especially if you're in the crypto sphere. So in the first instance, hello, Jonathan. How are you? I am doing excellent. And by the way, I should also, somebody somebody pointed out I should announce who I am. My name is Aviva Onop, and I'm the host of Crypto and Blockchain Talk. So I would like to, again, welcome everyone. And I'd also like Jonathan to do a big fat disclaimer right now while I take a, a sip of tea and sit back and listen. <laughs> Jonathan, rip through it. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me, as always. All of the information that Aviva and I provide is for educational purposes only. None of this information is to be used as financial advice investment advice, and definitely not legal advice. Do your own research and make sure that you are well aware of whatever, whether you put fiat into it or whether you put your crypto into it, make sure you know what you're getting into. Absolutely. In other words, do your freaking homework. Okay, so Jonathan, (laughs) I told you when I just called you up, I said, look, you know, I'm triggered. Some of this stuff today that we're going to talk about has literally set me alight. And we will go into that in a very sharp minute. But let's first start with something not so volatile as such. Or maybe it is. I don't know. And that's the new crypto bill that was introduced in the US Congress. And it's supposed to be the most comprehensive yet. Now, there's a lot of information written about this. And basically, there's a representative in the U.S. government. His name is Don Bayer. He's a Democrat. And he has put forward a bill. And the name of this bill, which is 58 pages of probably very enthralling reading, is called the Digital Asset Market Structure and Investor Protection Act. And Basically, this bill would allow the Treasury Secretary to veto the creation of stable coins and also direct regulators to define rules for DeFi and possibly create a charter for crypto exchanges, plus a whole bunch of other goodies in this bag. Now, I have to tell you that before we really go into the legalese and the legal side of stuff and how this is going to affect people because it's also going to there's a a section on here which i think we kind of alluded to in the last podcast there's a section that we were talking about last week that was about collecting tax data for obviously reporting to the irs these kinds of things but i don't really mind videoing the creation of stable coins because that in a way is going to just lead me straight into tether and you know i i'm just like an attack (laughs) dog when we talk about tether because that thing and and I, when I say that thing, folks, I mean that thing. And if you still haven't listened to my 5,000 other podcasts where I talk in depth with some very, very intelligent people about Tether and what's behind it, because a stable coin is supposed to be in a one-to-one ratio to the US dollar, and therefore it means that somewhere in some repository, some bank, some vault, you're supposed to have one US dollar or whatever the denomination and fiat is for every crypto that you have. And we all know that Tether has a bunch of belly button fluff and lollipop sticks in their vault. And so I don't mind the government overseeing the or having the ability, I should say, the ability to veto the creation of stable coins. 
I, I actually quite like that. But uh, and I'm sure, you know, people like Circle and, and you know, for uh, USDC, I'm sure people like this are probably not very happy with this act. But there is a number of other things in this piece of legislation. And what it really does just to sum it all up it says that we need adult supervision in the crypto sector because everybody is running amok like a bunch of dumb babies. And a lot of people are losing their shirts and a lot of rich people are getting incredibly rich. And I think that there is a lot of ground that this bill is trying to cover to, in essence, it looks to me like, protect those who really do need the protection. So let me hand it over to you so that you can give a little bit more body to what this bill really does encompass. And I know that I just launched straight in with the stablecoin <laughs> aspect, but you gotta forgive me for that. And again, folks, uh, if the most concise compilation of content regarding what has happened and is happening with Tether, just Google Amy Castor, C-A-S-T-O-R, Amy Castor, and Tether timeline, the Tether timeline, and just read it all there. And that's a really good encapsulated synopsis of what is happening with that quote unquote stable coin. So without further ado, could you just go over this latest bill and how you feel it's going to be impacting both individuals and businesses? In totality, this is not nearly as big as, as the crypto tax issue that we're having to deal with. But that being said, I do think that any type of bill or any type of uh, address to uh, crypto or crypto related assets or, or blockchain based assets or even anything novel because most lawyers who uh, recognize that the law we write now uh, may have uh, significant implications for the law and, and how business is conducted in the future recognize how important getting it right the first time is. I do think that this is a good arguably first step compared to all of the other first steps that have been taken. I do not think it will progress far. Congress has a lot bigger, badder, more important issues on their plate right now. But there are some really important gaps that need to be filled. The CFTC believes that it has dominion over anything that is a, a on a blockchain that is not Bitcoin. I think that, and, and most uh, attorneys in this space think that's a little bit dubious at best. New commissioners coming uh, to the uh, CFTC. So that entire kind of model is probably going to change and we're going to get to see what those commissioners believe and what quote unquote is a derivative uh, on a blockchain. And I'm excited about that. Would I like to see legislation that would help guide those future commissioners? Absolutely. Um, but it needs to be the proper legislation. That's the problem that we had recently where all of, I guess, the millions and millions of dollars of lobbying money that has been spent in the crypto industry is nowhere near the millions and millions, if not billions of dollars of, of money spent in the financial industry, because we were really tripped up by this sneaking in of this crypto tax bill. And I think that if we do move something forward, especially in a standalone bill, it needs to be as robust as possible and actually hear from the community. And that's everyone from the Bitcoin maximalists uh, you know, who, who believe when the world burns down, Bitcoin will still be there somehow. And, and then you know, the futurists who recognize that some type of blockchain or some type of immutable ledger is arguably destiny. And I think that if you combine every spectrum within that crazy array, you're going to get a solution that makes hopefully significant sense. Because I believe this is a cold war that we're waging arguably against the, the vast majority of unregulated nations, uh, specifically Russia and, mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of China and things like that, because what's going on is, which is the same reason they want to regulate stable coins, right, is because you have billions of dollars of, of stables that are basically transacting as normal dollars, uh, whether, you know, they're properly backed or not, we can, we can have clearly hours worth of arguments. Mm -hmm. But we don't need to write laws necessarily for the U.S., but we need to write laws for the future and for the world because everybody is going to be looking at us to see, well, what did they, what did the Yanks finally do? Is say? <laughs> well, and you, you're, you're completely correct. And just to, I know it's just a little bit of a tangent, but you mentioned it, so I'm just going to throw it in there. But August has shaped up to be Binance's worst month ever so far 
because of regulators and law enforcement agencies across the globe. So agencies across the globe are clamping down on rogue players. And they are and I don't all think it's going to stop. No, and it's I not going to stop. It will not stop. And because everyone's now trying to write regulations, because there's a lot of criminal elements within this entire cryptosphere, the entire blockchain arena. And going back to this bill, overnight, Janet Yellen would be granted full authority to either permit or prohibit stablecoins denominated in USD or other fiat currencies. And it would also authorize the Federal Reserve to finally issue a CBDC or a central bank digital currency. It would absolutely clarify that other rival stablecoins are not US legal tender. Now, I am fully, fully for a CBDC in the United States. A That's another problem. I'm like gritting my teeth here. Because I just don't understand. And, you know, we have a lot of really important people who listen to this podcast now, people who definitely have weight in the U.S. government. So I know they're listening to this when I say, I don't understand what's taking so flipping long. How freaking hard is this? I mean, you have some of the smartest people in the world in the United States. There are like 15 different blockchain CBDC working groups in the U.S. government. (laughs) Half of them probably don't even know who the other half are. They're not working together. The whole thing's a flipping mess. I have been talking about this particular topic for years now. Guys, get your act together. Just get the freaking CBDC thing going. I mean, seriously, do you want me to fly over and handle it for you? I'm happy to do so. (laughs) Send me the plane ticket and I'll organize it for you. There's a long way from this bill becoming law. I mean, it's only just been, I should say, submitted. It's in consideration. Nothing has been approved yet. But we do know that there's a lot of people who do feel that this bill has legs. Chris Giancarlo, who is the former CFTC chairman, he actually put out a tweet, which is getting actually a lot of likes and shares. I mean, I'm actually impressed. But Chris Giancarlo said, only one U.S. regulatory agency has experience regulating markets for Bitcoin and crypto, and it's not the SEC. It is the CFTC. And if the Biden administration is serious about sensible crypto regulation, it needs to nominate a CFTC chairman. Now, we're going to get there's a reason why I'm actually talking about that in just a moment. We're going to get there. I know I keep saying in a moment, there's just so much to unpack. There's so much to unpack in all of this. There's other bills, which we know that part of that uh, trillion dollar infrastructure package, we also know that in there was a lot of legislation, which also pertained to cryptocurrency in terms of taxation. So that's actually interesting that there's a lot of bills coming forward, a lot of movement in the direction of regulation. But I'm going to have to step now just to just into this area. So the former SEC chair, and guys, I want all the listeners to know that anyone who emailed me and said that they were happy to bet me a coffee, you owe me those coffees. So that's like four coffees. So um, anyone who is happy, I, I won the bet. So you owe me a coffee. Jay Clayton, the ex-SEC chair, is now working for the billion-dollar crypto platform Fireblocks, okay? So to be quite frank with you, just in the, you know, it, it really does, it really answers a lot of questions that I posed to you a couple of years ago when he was actually the acting SEC chair, Because I was saying, you know, why is this so wishy-washy? Why can't they just do certain things or whatsoever? And I don't, you know, maybe this dude allegedly, who knows what legal words to use, but maybe this dude already knew knew what move he was going to make after his chairmanship. But apparently he loves the potential efficiencies of this technology. Yeah, that's that's his official quote. It's more like he likes the (laughs) potential efficiencies of a $2 billion valuation, because that's what Fireblocks is. It's a multi-billion dollar company. It provides a, quote unquote, one-stop platform for institutions to hold, transfer, and issue digital assets across different jurisdictions. And they have clients such as Revolut, eToro, and the crypto bank Galaxy Digital. So we're talking there's a lot of money and a lot of power just in this one multi-billion dollar company alone. So 
I don't I don't know how to do the I was right dance, you know, on a podcast. <laughs> I mean, you can't see me. You can't see me doing like it's so obvious why things in some instances are moving slow. Am I just turning really cynical? Anybody who's been a a, a part of the the public's uh, quote unquote public servant has always made their money or at least traditionally after their public service, right? And I think Clayton was eventually going to go, of course, to, you know, the hottest industry, which is is crypto and blockchain. But, you know, I I think that overall, we need as many smart people in this industry as we can get. We're we're still, you know, the running joke is that we're still so early, but there is exceptional value in having really smart people who know their industry. Let me tell you something right now. I'm not convinced about the whole Jay Clayton thing, because even even Hester Pierce criticized her own agency just this last Monday after she announced the enforcement action against Poloniex. Yeah, I think there's still a lot of bad people out there. And I think that for the most part, the SEC either didn't want to chase them down because of lack of resources or in some cases, you know, there was just no overarching desire to get that win because it wasn't a big enough feather in the hat i don't know i don't you know know the internals of what the enforcement team is looking at i know that they do like the big wins and and to see some of those scalps on their wall you know those are the kind of things that do deter in this industry and that all makes sense but i'm talking about like some pretty obvious stuff i'm just going to quote hester pierce and you know and Everyone else who's ever been on a podcast with me where I've talked about Hester Pierce, I sometimes have not agreed with her and sometimes very strongly disagreed with her and have even written a couple of letters in rebuttal to some things that she has said directly. But this is pretty telling. And this is the quote. Pierce, also known as Crypto Mom, argued that the SEC was taking its time in dealing with cryptocurrencies at the time. And this is a direct quote. During the period at issue here, mid-2017 through 2019, the commission was moving very cautiously with respect to regulated entities' engagement with crypto assets. And she went on to elaborate that basically if Poloniex had tried to register and had it done so, they would have been in a pretty long waiting queue. And she goes on and on. But what she said was, given how slow we have been in determining how regulated entities can interact with crypto, market participants may understandably be surprised to see us come onto the scene now with our enforcement guns blazing. Now, my question was always during this time when there were multiple scams and hacks and all different kinds of cons going on, I was asking for the longest time why nothing was being done. Half of our podcasts, as you know, are Mm -hmm. done on scams. And I am not going to say any more than that, because any smart person can read between the lines. So yes, the SEC this year has brought forward 75 enforcement actions. But these are probably 75 enforcement actions that should have taken place literally from the word go. I mean, it, you know, what's taken so bloody long? For real. And now you have um, Gary Gensler, the new SEC chairman, who is definitely a hardliner in his approach, it looks like, even though I haven't seen any real stances. He has outlined his approach and his priorities to regulating crypto. And I have a feeling that some real legislation now is going to be coming out. It will be coming out soon because there is still a lot of issues in the industry and a lot of people. And I'm not talking rich people. I'm talking about normal, everyday, I go to work people who are going to or are now getting stung. And they are getting stung by the droves, either thefts, which are happening within many crypto exchanges, hacks, which are also happening. Uh, Japan's liquid exchange was hacked and 80 million is now missing of cryptocurrency. And then you have this breach also done by hackers to the poly network where 600 million in crypto was stolen. So, you know, this stuff is being taken one way or another. It doesn't impact the likes of Elon Musk or Bezos. It doesn't impact anybody but the average Joe. 
I promise you this. And so that is really what I think kind of it's, you know, I told you I'm triggered. I'm triggered on a lot of stuff, as you can probably hear in my voice. So what is your comment on that? I'm with you. Gensler, for all of his crypto hate, has been very, very pro-retail investor. And the apes uh, of, of Wall Street bets will, you know, agree with me on that. Whether that, you know, truly means that Citadel and, and others who may be perpetrating fraud on the market uh, are finally dealt with, uh, we'll see. But there are two types of regulatory issues, in my mind, in the crypto sphere that need to be addressed. Um, and they're, they're, they're primarily a knowledge base issue, right? You have some type of offering where it's an NFT or a security token or something that is being offered for the first time and the transactionality is there. Most of us know on the legal side of things of where these things fall, but there is not an approval process for the SEC. There's not anything you know remotely close to saying this is SEC approved kind of thing. And that's a little bit dissuading and a little bit you know disconcerting because I wish that was a simpler thing and, and something that made sense as, as well as normal exemptions and all these other kind of fun things that we do. So I would love to see, you know, an exemption to say, hey, this randomly falls outside of our purview and, and can be done on a blockchain kind of thing. Uh, and, and all the, the legal nerds in uh, the room are, are listening to this. are going to be like, well, the Securities and Exchange Acts don't say that. Um, but, you know, that's where rule interpretation and that's what, you know, the SEC has the power to do, which is why, They've added the broker-dealer rules for the FINRA, SIE, and, and Series 7 and stuff like that. So it is this adoption within the rulemaking provisions that should allow for things like just a registering of an entity that's saying, hey, I'm doing a token-related offering that has a securities-related backing or it is exempt from being a securities under these narrow provisions of possibly the, the CFTC and SEC working together and figuring out what those mean. But that's one of the problems, right? Like that, there is nowhere to go to verify something. And then comparison with, you know, all of the networks that are involved, and I call them networks loosely because uh, it's everything from DeFi uh, and liquidity pools and pools and staking and, and things of that nature all the way up to actual exchanges, uh, where exchanges get to come and say, okay, who's our regulator? <laughs> uh, which regulator do we want? And I think that that's really exciting and arguably kind of good for the industry right now. But it's very confusing for the marketplace because we have Coinbase not being regulated by anyone arguably other than FinCEN because it has money transmission license. But it also has, you know, it, and it has been hit by CFTC anti-fraud provisions where insiders were trading before coins were listed. And then you have a, a place like Voyager Digital, who's got a real strong position and and those guys understand the marketplace where, you know, they actually are uh, saying, hey, we think that Vincent is our regulator. We are subscribing to this model as best we can within the rules. And that's why they have generally more assets than most. And that's where, you know, the bouncing of everything is, is, OK, what regulator do we want? Uh, and then, you know, for the average retail investor, they have to go and say, well, is this person applicable in my state? You know, I'm in New York. And so, you know, Kraken's not available in New York. But it's one of those situations where going to collect, uh, going to play Pokemon and getting all the MSB licenses or getting all proper licenses is something that I think needs to occur. But it needs to be better addressed by saying, hey, we are a crypto related or, or crypto registered entity or something like that. And that's where I think, you know, the, the novelness of these bills that, you know, keep being introduced to the house or sometimes the Senate uh, every once in a while are, are truly meaningful because we do need to figure out how to regulate technology. The same thing can be said for when T-Mobile just admit, uh, announced another hack uh, and, and you know, more information was lost. You can't go to a regulator and say, Hey, I need you to verify my code. Uh, or, hey, I need you to check and make sure that this is compliant. Uh, they can't do that. But if I go build a house, I have to have a home inspector come in and say, yeah, you, your home builder, your, your electrician did all this stuff right. And I think that's what we're starting to work towards, because as we grow, whether it's as a global society or just as a country, we need to make sure the infrastructure is not something where a rug pull can happen, whether that's an intentional rug pull or an inadvertent rug pull like 
uh, you know, has happened recently. And, and I think that's where the evolution of all of this societal technology merging, you know, ultimately ends up is we've got to have a test to prove that this is, you know, the appropriate jurisdiction or this is the appropriate regulator. Or this is the appropriate technology to be using for this platform. And if there's not, then there's an exemption process. So it does require rewriting a lot of these laws and trying to figure out uh, what this means. And I know all of the Bitcoin maximalists and all the people who are super pro blockchain are like, oh, we don't need more regulation. But in actuality, we do, because if we want to get more things on the blockchain and understand where our medicine's coming from or where our health records are or where our dental records are or who actually has our car, all of those kind of things need to be on a secure network. They need to be on an immutable network. Unfortunately or fortunately, that's what blockchain is. Well, you know, if anything proves that really concretely, it's the Equifax hack. Because if Equifax, who's a multi-billion dollar company, and by the way, who the government um, pretty much protected during the Equifax hack when, you know, hundreds of, uh, well, I think 147, 148, let's just round it to a cool 150 million people had their data stolen. And that included myself. And so, oh, but, and by the way, we were all given out of court settlements where uh, everyone, I mean, I was awarded 10 U.S. dollars. And by the way, from the Equifax hack, I ended up having to do a whole bunch of stuff to change because it was not just in the U.K., it was in Canada and the United Kingdom. So I had to, my phone was, uh, I had to end up, I ended up having to actually get rid of my phone because the Equifax hack, all because they could have used something which was more secure, i.e. blockchain. But stepping back to what we were talking about in terms of knowing right and wrong, in term and kind of already having that knowledge of what you're supposed to be doing when you are running a company and you're doing something heavily financial. Now, you are a lawyer exactly in this space. You do this for a living where you know, and I know you're going to start laughing, where people do a whole bunch (laughs) of stuff and then they call you up and you are there. I know this for a fact. And you are like in disbelief with this look on your face like, why didn't you file these forms? Why didn't you call a lawyer before you started this process instead of now trying to wangle your way backwards and try to do, you know, a lot of people know when they're doing wrong from the word go, but they still proceed hoping they're going to get away with it, i.e. every single crypto project who now the SEC or FinCEN or CFTC is going after. And we all know that right now, we talked about in the last podcast, CZ is right now trying to change his underwear in a quiet corner. Yeah. And of course, (laughs) Uniswap delisted a hundred freaking tokens from their interface. And that includes the options and the indexes. Okay. Because you know what? They're not stupid. They went, oh my God, uh, there's a lot of regulatory issues here, perhaps. Let's just quietly get rid of these 100 tokens and maybe nobody will notice. I mean, you know, I, it's really actually quite funny because everyone looks at how much money, you know, I, I have to tell you, there's an intern in my office. And this intern said something really, he's German. And he said, it is all about greed. Greed is what is happening. (laughs) And I said, you know what? I said, absolutely correct. Because people are looking at the billions of dollars being made by literally just going, you know, someone's smoking a blunt on, you know, while they're sitting on someone's couch going, hey, listen, this this schmuck just made a hundred million dollars. Let's let's start a DeFi platform. And let me tell you where that's getting people right now. Yeah. So right now, <laughs> it's so funny. It really is. The whole thing is hysterical. I mean, seriously, one day when we're living on Mars and we look back on all of this and, you know, we're all using whatever coin at that time. We're going to sit back and laugh at all this because this is literally like falling and getting up and then falling and getting up again. But two guys are probably going to go to jail for a very long time. Why are they going to go to jail, you ask? Well, I'm happy to tell you because the SEC just recently brought charges against these two guys from Florida because they opened up a DeFi company and they raised $30 million by selling illegal securities. Yes, I filled in the word for you, Jonathan, before you (laughs) did. And uh, via so-called smart contracts. And this is, by the way, in quotes on this site. So, you know, it's one of a, and, you know, that this number is not included in the 75 major actions taken by the SEC 
towards crypto companies. These are one of the low level ones that for some reason don't get included in that count. Um, I think it's because they haven't been operating and therefore fined. This is one of the many, many poor schmucks, like I said before, who basically said, yeah, we're going to set up this offshore company. And because it's in the Cayman Islands, I mean, it's not the United States. We're going to just like pump millions of dollars through this thing. And uh, yeah, they can't touch us. And in a minute, I'm going to have you explain. I just want to talk about this Ohio guy for a second. And then I'm going to have you unleash because I want you to explain how the Cayman Islands, how the SEC has jurisdiction in many places. Then you have this Ohio guy, which is big news. I mean, this has hit mainstream, not just the crypto outlets. You know, some Ohio dude, he pleaded guilty to running a $300 million Bitcoin laundering conspiracy to help drug traffickers. Now, you see, this is the reason why a lot of regulators have big issues with the DEXs, DeFi platforms and Binances, etc., which is, of course, uh, an exchange of this world. Uh, Because, you know, this guy was basically moving multi, hundreds of millions of dollars of Bitcoin to help bad people hide the source of their income or hide their money. And this all stemmed from the dark net. And it's just another one of these weaving this web of intrigue again. But it's very, I think when you see just how many tentacles this animal actually has, it's not an octopus, it's a different kind of animal, because of course, there's a lot of good in in most things. But you know, it's very easy to take something that should be good, and then of course, use it for b- very bad things. Just like I, I just did a podcast on deep fakes, deep fakes, you know, if everybody on this planet was literally um, like Julia Andrews in Sound of Music, we'd all be spinning around wearing circle hoop skirts and singing in the hills, and nobody would ever say a bad word to anyone. But that's not really the case. So, you know, people are now using deep fakes for some pretty sick things. And I'm not going to go over that in this podcast and ruin that podcast. But I'll let your minds go there if you really must. But what I will say is that, you know, the the people who are doing these, like this guy in Ohio, who we just talked about, um, he's 38 years old. And he is going to be doing a minimum term of 10 years, maximum prison term of 20 And he's getting a fine of hundreds of millions of dollars, but he'll probably hide that in Bitcoin somewhere that nobody will find. But the whole point is this, allegedly, I mean, I'm just making stuff up. Like I said, you can't sue me because we did a disclaimer. But what I can tell you is the following. There's a lot of stuff which needs heavy regulation. There's another reason why I'm also so on edge, if you want to call it that. I want to go back to what I said about people who are setting up all of these platforms, be it DeFi or or NFT or whatever the hell, or mixes. Why? Because I need another sip of tea. Can you explain to the listeners why you can't just set up an offshore company and think that you're untouchable? Oh, you totally can. You just set off offshore and you're fine. The SEC can't touch you. Um, That was sarcasm, folks. Uh, I, I mean, I deal with this, I kid you not, almost every single week. There and you it, go. It baffles me because I don't know if whether it's a misconception that, you know, originated during the ICO craze and they get bad legal advice, whether it's from, you know, somebody's blog or, or you know, maybe originally we used to get a lot of bad clients who got bad legal advice from other lawyers uh, who saw how much ICOs were making and then tried to do ICOs themselves. Uh, without having any knowledge of securities laws. And uh, for those don't that, you know, not to toot my own horn or others that practice in this space, securities is the most dangerous law there is because they will throw my ass in jail right alongside my client, if not name me first. And the reason that is, is because we are considered gatekeepers, uh, literally, in the marketplace. And so we have to conduct due diligence. We have to do all of these certain, you know, regulatory requirements before we let something loose in the marketplace. And so if you have a securities attorney who knows what the hell they're doing, they're going to keep you out of jail because they don't want to go to jail too. And as I joke with my clients, I don't look good in orange and I am not interested in going to jail. 
So with that being said, you know, all of these either lawyers or wannabe lawyers or fake lawyers has decided that, oh, if you're offshore, the SEC can't touch you. They don't have jurisdiction. Well, that's not true, uh, right? Because if you offer something to Americans or you're an American company or you have an American subsidiary or what we call Nexus and, and the CFTC and I are fighting about Nexus. But uh, as long as you have something that basically touches the U.S. shores, then the SEC can get get you. Same thing goes for FinCEN. And that's one of the reasons that anybody who's ever sent a wire, especially an international wire, guess what? It bounces through New York, uh, the Southern District of New York. And that's how we get jurisdiction over you as Americans. Uh, that's that's one of the reasons that you know we can do sanctions against Iran and, and, and Russia and all these other kind of fun things is because uh, most wires and, and, and uh, ACH payments are, are routed through some territorial jurisdiction in which the U.S. has control. And so the same thing goes for crypto. If you just have something offshore and you wire the United States and you really have to take you know the proactive measures of making sure that they're not using a VPN or anything really creative like that, like you arguably have to do your own type of KYC, then you could arguably say that you are offshore completely. But if you have people on shore and, and hold themselves out as a place of business, then you're going to run into some significant problems uh, in saying that you're an offshore company. And so uh, due to the nature of DeFi and some really shitty legal advice people have been given, whether it's from some of these bigger firms or whether it's some of these so-called wannabe uh, securities lawyers, these operations don't work. And eventually they will cause a lot more harm to the individual and the marketplace then they're worth uh, the same reason that, you know, everybody thought setting up in Gibraltar or Malta or these other places would, you know, kind of ignore you from SEC rules and, and regulations. And and unfortunately or fortunately, that's just not the case. There's a couple of things I'm, I'm, I'm pressing the BS button on. Now, I want to just say, again, listeners, I'm starting to think I'm a bit of a not I, I don't want to say the word oracle because there's another oracle has different meanings in blockchain but i'm starting <laughs> to believe i'm a bit of a fortune teller because another piece of news has come to light which makes me so brilliant because i guessed this already on not one but two podcasts it's obviously recorded so it's not like you know anyone could say no you didn't say that it's actually recorded because i said when uh, it was on one of the many podcasts I've done on Elon Musk, when uh, he was shilling for Doge. Matter of fact, I'm going to start making T-shirts, and I'm, I'm going to literally have on there his picture, shilling for Doge, because let me tell you something right now. I said to everyone on the podcast, I said, I guarantee that Elon's move is going to be, he's got, because um, it made sense to me. Why would he take one of the biggest shit coins in the world. And that's what they're called, folks. I'm not being foul-mouthed for no reason. There are, obviously, it's an altcoin if we're going to be nice. I mean, he could have bought many. I mean, there's a lot of crap coins out there. You know, you have um, the COVID coin. He could have bought COVID coin. He could have bought so many others. But he was shilling for Doge. And I said on air... I think he's going to do something to make a move to kind of like take it over and then rebrand it to something else coin. I said that's the only reason I can think why he would go for this coin. And then I read this little tiny tidbit and I started to smile, at least on one side of my face. The other side will curl up in a couple of months. The Dogecoin Foundation has just released the following statement that they have been reestablished with a renewed focus to accelerate the development of Dogecoin. Among the foundation's advisors are Ethereum's co-founder Vitalik Buterin and Jared Birchall, who is the head of Elon Musk's family office and will represent the billionaire Dogecoin advocate as legal and financial advisor. Now, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, folks, that I sound like I'm like so anti all of this, but I, I'm a blockchain girl in a blockchain world. It's fantastic. I'm made of plastic and all that. And I definitely <laughs> love crypto, but this smells. Sorry. It stinks. And I got to tell you something, shilling for Doge just got a whole new meaning. Can I have a comment on this, please, sir? I don't understand the Doge push. I, I get people love that stuff. And I know that Cuban and uh, Elon have been tweeting about it or something. And, and they find it a little ridiculous when they do that. Um, 
I find that very interesting. You know, I mean, look, even the guy who who invented Doge is like, I don't get it. You know, even he's confused. It goes back to really, you know, maybe maybe the way I'm going to wrap up this podcast is almost like a bit of nostalgia in that I love the idea of decentralization. I love the idea of common man, like you do, coming together. I know you love this idea. I know that you really do love Kumbaya. I know that I love the whole Julie Andrews idea of spinning on mountaintops, singing The Hills Are Alive. (laughs) I get this, but it just ruins it for me. These people are ruining my karma, dude. They're ruining my dream. And, you know, when I see stuff like this, I just go... You know, Vitalik, why? I just I just don't understand. You know, I mean, really, I'm not sure if we're rushing this whole... I think crypto was doing beautifully when it was growing organically, you know, when it was founded by that group of merry men. And, you know, then you had, you know, the, like you keep talking about the smooth-brained apes who are like, you know, the Reddit crew and, you know, the Reddit armies, you know, and real down-to-earth people we're actually pushing this forward, that forward momentum, real, it was growing organically. And I feel like now it's a bit of a, I feel like it's a, it's got this taste, a bad taste. It's, it's just doing something I don't like. And because it's doing, and I can see what's happening. Anyone can, if they open their eyes wide enough, because this whole idea of how, something when it all of a sudden goes from a gentle organic growth to what feels like forced fist down the throat chill 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 i feel like people are ruining the party do you feel that way or is it just i'm having a bad thursday i agree and i think you're right i think there have been a lot of the wall street kind of investment crew who've come in and recognized the benefits of crypto and and it has become a little bit more commercialized Mm. um my biggest fear is it becomes overly commercialized and we don't really build a better world we just build uh, a new wealth gap for uh people who have already been you know fairly wealthy which is one of the Mm -hmm. reasons i'm you know very frustrated with uh you know Mm. elons of the world right i mean i don't understand if i'm the only one who can see when you have such incredibly wealthy people going into these ecosystems and investing it's it's you know it's kind of the equivalent of leaving your toy in the sandbox and a bigger (laughs) kid comes along and says i want that toy i want to play with it and then takes your transformer and turns it into a totally different toy that yeah um he can play with but no one else really can we can just look from a distance I'm not the only one who can see this. I can answer that question for the listeners. I know for a fact regulators and really see where this could go. And hence the reason for now, the foot on the gas of anything to do with regulation in this space, because it's uh, it's looking dicey. It's not what it was supposed to be. It's really, in my opinion anyway, and look, everyone's entitled to their opinion. I'm entitled. I mean, this is my podcast, so I'm allowed to say my opinion loud and clear. You have your opinion. I love your opinions, and I love to hear them loud and clear. Uh, And that's the beauty of a podcast, because we get to voice our opinions as different as they are, and people can also do their own research, as we said at the beginning of the podcast, and kind of make up their own minds as they go along. And yes, uh, today I might be ultra cynical. I took my ultra cynical pill. But... um, you know, we're, we're just going to, I guess, have to wait and see how this plays out. But before we close out and everything, I'm going to now tell everyone what is coming in the future. And in, in, it'll be next month. But I have a world exclusive with the CFTC themselves. They are coming on. Now, the CFTC have never come onto the podcast, uh, onto a podcast as a guest The only time the CFTC have done anything is on their own CFTC podcast, which is now defunct. And they've also been recorded as part of an interview that was done at a conference, and then that was streamed onto a podcast. They're actually coming on as a guest. 
uh, to crypto and blockchain talk. They are making time out of their busy schedules and coming on to crypto and blockchain talk where I will be grilling them on a number of um, questions. I will be talking to them about what the future regulatory landscape will look like, what is serious in discussion, what is more dreamscape, but that is coming soon. So what I will do now is close out for today. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on to Crypto and Blockchain Talk. You know the love is real. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited and honored to always be a part of this educational experience with you. Well, I want to just thank everyone for listening to this week's edition of Crypto and Blockchain Talk. Please download this podcast on one of the many podcasting platforms that are written on our website, Crypto and Blockchain Talk. You can find a whole slew of podcasting platforms where we will stream this podcast onto. We also want you to know that you can listen to this podcast on our sister radio station, Crypto 24 Radio. That's Crypto24Radio.com. You can listen to this podcast and many other interviews and lots of cool music and lots of other things 24-7 around the world. On top of that, you can talk to us through one of our social media channels being Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But most importantly, we love to hear from you directly. We love these emails. We also love the positive comments that we are getting off of the different channels. So for instance, we just had a really lovely comment from someone who said that they loved how forthright and honest we were about the crypto industry. And that is because we want to give you the right picture. I also want to thank you again for taking time out of your very busy schedule and listening to us. We know that you have many choices to listen to out there. And the fact that you tune into us means the world. And I mean that with all sincerity. So please be safe, take care, and goodbye for now. 